Thank you very much for uh, letting me interrupt your lunch with uh, what's one of my passions. Uh, every day people ask me, are you happy? Is your wife happy? Do you like it here? And I tell them, look at me, I go home with a smile. You know, and when you go home with a smile, you know you're doing what you love. So I'm going to talk to you today about one piece of technology in this absolutely gorgeous, magnificent, beautiful facility Baptist, uh, that, that Baptist has brought to South Florida, Miami Cancer Institute. So it's really proton therapy, and the focus of my talk is going to be who benefits from proton therapy. I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. I'm going to introduce the concept of cancer in general to you first, just because I think it's important to recognize that when one puts in such a large effort, there is a very good reason for it. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technology of proton therapy. Hopefully not too much, because I know there are not too many physicists in the, in the audience here today, so I don't want to bore you with that. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the patients who really benefits. Before I start, though, I want to truly state that I'm honored with great humility to be here to be a enamored lecturer, because I'm no, I know that this is a once a year event, and uh, it's not easy to come up to the podium and be selected for this. I was asked to come up last year. I had a kid that was getting an award at school, and my wife said, don't come home if you don't do this. So, <laughs> so that's why I made it in year two, so thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to start off my talk by introducing a book to you. For those of you who are curious about cancer and want a good read, a read that's really, really stunning, it's this book written by Siddharth Mukherjee. It's entitled The Emperor of All Maladies. It's the emperor of all maladies because truly cancer is the disease that many of us, most of us, fear more than almost anything else. These are some of the quotes describing this book. From its first documented appearance thousands of years ago, through the epic battles of the last century to cure, control, and conquer it, to a radical new understanding of its essence, the story of cancer is the story of human ingenuity. And that is absolutely true and correct. And hence the moonshot, because it's going to take resilience, perseverance, and ingenuity to cure this disease. Centuries of discoveries, setbacks, victories, and deaths. Yes, lots and lots of deaths. These actually all represent an infinitely resourceful adversary, the disease of cancer. I'm going to take you back into the past, because this is not a new story. This is really a very old story. Cancer has been described as a monster more insatiable than the guillotine. In fact, ancient Egyptians described this disease in their papyri. This is potentially man's oldest foe. The first known case of cancer, this is a great trick question, was discovered by Louis Leakey, who's perhaps best known for finding Lucy, one of the earliest human skeletons. Near Lucy's skeleton, Leakey unearthed another skeleton dating back to 4000 BC. And the jawbone of this individual carried evidence of lymphoma, a cancer. So even 4000 years back, in the old Dubai plains of Tanzania, Leakey found evidence of cancer. The story goes back into ancient Greece, ancient Rome. In Persia, in 440 BC, the queen of Persia at that time, Atossa, experienced every woman's worst nightmare, a bleeding lump in her breast. There was no mammography in those days. Today, she could be treated with various options, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, targeted therapies. She could potentially be cured back then in 440 BC. And remember, she was the queen. Her options were limited. She wrapped herself in sheets until the pain became so severe that she allowed her slave to cut off her breast. Cancer does not discriminate by age. A newborn can be afflicted by leukemia. A young infant can have a tumor in the eye. The reflex that you see in the eye is a retinoblastoma, an eye tumor. Even the healthiest succumb to it. A young teenager with a Ewing sarcoma in the bone, you can see the bone eating away at the skeleton. Or a 22-year-old with Hodgkin's lymphoma with a scan that lights up like a Christmas tree, showing disease extensively affecting the lymphatic system throughout the body. It can be inside or outside the body, hidden deep inside the brain in a 76-year-old with a glioblastoma, a lethal tumor that we all know very well because several 
well-known politicians have retired, uh, recently succumbed to this, or an inflammatory breast cancer outside the body to be seen by all in a 37-year-old mother. What's really, really tough and difficult is a story like you see at the bottom, the toughest nine months pregnant with cancer. So even during pregnancy, the woman had to battle her cancer. It is ubiquitous. It is all around us. A recent study estimated that in the US, one in two males and one in three females are at risk of developing cancer. One in three males and one in five females will actually die from it. If we bring these statistics home to Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach with a population of approximately six million people and a 50 to 50 male to female ratio, we can compute that approximately 1.6 million individuals in our neighborhoods will die of cancer in their lifetime. What does this, what does this mean? What is 1.6 million? If we add up the total number of deaths in the Civil War, in the two world wars, in Vietnam, in Iraq, and Afghanistan, it's about half a million soldiers. Three times that population in our neighborhood will succumb to cancer. This is truly a war. It's this war that we are fighting thanks to individuals like Dr. Zinner. This is our mission statement at Miami Cancer Institute, and the words I've highlighted for you, comprehensive care, innovative, is what I'm going to focus on. But remember that this occurs in the context of one of Dr. Zinner's most famous quotes, high tech, high touch. So what is comprehensive about this place? Every potential technology for radiation oncology exists under a single roof. This fleet of radiotherapy devices, high-end, cutting-edge, technologically advanced, does not exist under a single roof anywhere in the world. We have everything from variant true beam linear accelerators to the cyber knife to the tomotherapy device, the gamma knife, one of our most recent acquisitions, the MR-guided linear accelerator, brachytherapy procedures, and of course, proton therapy. And I don't have the time to tell you about all of these technologies, and so I'm only going to tell you about proton therapy. So why? Why do we want to talk about protons? What is different about protons? All radiation, like light, has a path length. It'll travel a certain distance, and those distances are rather long. Protons are different. When protons interact with tissue, they have a defined depth at which they stop. As a consequence, there is no exit dose from proton radiation. That's really the major difference between protons and all of the forms of radiation. As a consequence, we can deliver therapeutic doses to tumors and spare normal tissue. Take the example of this target. This target is the brain and spinal cord in an individual that needs to have this treated because of disease spreading through the central nervous system. In such a patient, if we were to treat them with conventional photon radiation therapy, the beams would enter from the back, the beam dose is in color, and as you can see, the color gradient drops through the anterior or front portion of the body, and all of the areas illustrated in the red stars, the neck, the thorax, the abdomen, the pelvis, all the tissue in there that does not need radiation is getting exposed to some dose of radiation. This is a natural consequence of traditional X-ray therapy. In contrast, when the same target in the same patient is treated with proton therapy, we can get the beam to stop exactly where we want it to stop. And as a consequence, all of the tissues in the front are spared the excess radiation. Does this matter? Let me show you a real life case. This is a case I saw when I was at the University of Maryland. This is a patient in exactly the scenario that I just described to you. They needed to have their spine and their brain treated, and they were treated with photon radiation, which you can see on the image to the far left at the bottom. The radiation beam is exiting through the front of the chest wall. On the top is the image that shows what would have happened had this individual been treated with proton therapy. No radiation dose would have exited through the front of the chest. Five years after delivery of the radiation dose that you see in the bottom panel, this patient presented to me at the University of Maryland with the image that you see near me here, circled in red. This image is a cancer in the front of the chest in the breastbone. This is a sarcoma 
that this patient experienced as a consequence of the excess unnecessary radiation. Unfortunately, the patient succumbed to it. So we do have scenarios where we can cure patients of their first cancer, and sometimes, fortunately, rarely, they develop a second malignancy as a consequence of what we did. And this is clearly an area where protons would excel and avoid this complication. How often does this happen? In a study done at the Massachusetts General Hospital, they demonstrated that second cancers occur at a rate about, of about 13% in young children, young adults and children treated with conventional X-ray therapy. And this can be halved to about 6% with the use of proton therapy. So there's a significant reduction that can be achieved with proton therapy. So clearly, this is of value in young children, in young adults. But it's not all about preventing a second cancer. It's really about preventing risk to any organ in the body. This disease, which is a mouthful, medulloblastoma, is a highly curable tumor that typically occurs in two diverse populations, usually in the very young, but a small spike in the elderly. This disease, medulloblastoma, requires extensive radiation from the brain down to the spine. And if we look at technological comparisons, which is what the blue table shows, with conventional radiation compared to IMRT, which is just an acronym for a fancy form of radiation therapy, or with protons in red, we can see that when we compare normal tissues, the lowest dose to normal tissues, which do not need any radiation, is achieved with protons. For example, the hearing apparatus, the cochlea, receives the full dose of radiation with conventional radiation. About 30% of the radiation dose with fancy radiation techniques, and only about 2% with proton therapy. The heart receives about three quarters of the dose with conventional radiation, about a third of the dose with IMRT, and less than half a percent with proton therapy. So there are dramatic reductions in unnecessary dose to normal tissues in many scenarios, this being a classic prototypical stellar example of the value of proton therapy. And the obvious consequence of this is cost savings. And this is where our battles with insurance companies begin. This is a very nice modeling study from Scandinavia where they looked at the cost of delivering either conventional radiation therapy, labeled as CRT in this slide, or proton beam therapy, labeled as PBT in this slide. And as you can see, the initial cost of delivering proton therapy is two and a half fold higher for proton therapy than it is for conventional radiation. So clearly, proton therapy is more expensive. However, the cost of treating complications over the lifetime of this patient, eight-fold higher with conventional radiation compared to proton therapy. And therefore, in the lifetime of these patients, the more expensive therapy, proton therapy, is eventually two and a half times cheaper at the end of the day. So when we compute medical costs, and when we hold insurance companies accountable for the entire lifetime of an individual, rather than just the episodic cost of care at one point in time, the landscape changes dramatically. So let's talk a little technology at this point. How do we get to protons? And you know, I had a different title on this slide and one of the patients sent me a video. And this guy, is, uh, this guy likes to meditate and he likes to do yoga. And he had a title on his uh, YouTube video. And he said, they're splitting atoms at Miami Cancer Institute. I said, that's a catchy phrase. So I borrowed that phrase and I put it on my slides, splitting atoms to produce protons. But that's actually exactly what we do. We take hydrogen atoms and we separate them into electrons and protons. These protons are accelerated in a device called a cyclotron that you can see here as this big gray tank with the IBA label on it. And the acceleration of protons imparts energy to protons and therefore allows protons to penetrate tissue and go deep into tissue. Clinically useful protons need a lot of energy. They need to be accelerated to levels in the mega electron volt range, 200 million or more electron volts. It's a huge amount of energy that these protons need in order to be able to traverse across the body and reach the kind of depths that we need to take these protons to. 
When a proton reaches about 200 million electron volts, it travels at about half the speed of light. So the beam going from the cyclotron to the patient is almost instantaneous. It's a very rapid delivery. The protons are extracted from the cyclotron and they travel down a beam line that you can't see in this picture. I'll show you the beam line in the next picture. And then they enter one of multiple treatment rooms. We have three treatment rooms and patients can be treated in either of these rooms with proton therapy. So this is the slide that illustrates the process. Protons are generated in the cyclotron. You can see the engineering architectural drawing at the bottom. That little round structure is the cyclotron where the protons are produced. And all of the devices that you see in front of them represent the beam line and the beam path, which is about the length of a football field that feeds and serves three treatment bays or rooms. And this is an inside picture into one of the rooms. Of course, patients don't see any of this engineering that's all hidden behind concrete. So they get a very patient-friendly environment and all of this high-tech tubing, piping, you know, ele electrical conduits, uh, magnets, it's all hidden behind lots and lots of concrete. So where are we today with proton therapy at Miami Cancer Institute? We received uh, access to our first treatment room, the gantry, in November 2017, the second one in July 2018, and the third one, we just started treating patients last week. So all three of our beam, beam rooms are now open and treating patients. These gantries are all beam matched. What that means is they're identical to each other. If one goes down, we can certainly move our patients to another one of the, the gantries and treat patients you know, on the other gantry. That's important. This is a very, very, very high-tech device. And the slightest glitch means we don't use it. Everything must pass all the quality assurance tests every day. And so there's a potential that one of the rooms could go down and patients need to be switched over. We use a technology called pencil beam scanning. I'll show you what that means in a second, but it is really very, very nifty. And this allows us to treat patients with very complex diseases. To date, we have completed treatment on about 90 patients. And our current rate of treating patients is about 40 patients a day. We will probably be hitting about 50 patients a day by next week. These are just the numbers over time. The blue numbers represent the first room or the first gantry. The orange numbers are when the second gantry kicked in. And now we have the third gantry that has kicked in as of last week. So what is this pencil beam scanning that I was referring to? To explain pencil beam scanning to you, I first need to explain the concept of passive scattering, which is historically how proton therapy has been delivered. What happens in passive scattering is a kidney bean shaped tumor would be treated with a series of proton beams that would hit the tumor from the backside and move to the front. And everything that you see in bright white represents high doses of radiation. So if you look beyond the tumor, it's all dark. There's no radiation beyond the tumor. So distal, further away from the tumor, there is no radiation dose. All the tissue is protected. But look at the beam on the way in. There are portions that are as bright outside the tumor as they're in the tumor. This is the price that passive scattering has to pay because it's the nature of the technology. Pencil beam scanning places the beam in tiny little volumes, like the head of a pencil lead, starting from the back of the tumor, in rows that move from behind the tumor to the front of the tumor. And as a consequence, just like passive scattering, there's no radiation dose beyond the tumor, but if you look in front of the tumor, the intensity of the beam is dramatically lower and therefore on the way in, tissues also receive a lower dose of radiation compared to passive scattering. So this is a significant improvement on the older technique of proton therapy. So who benefits from this? Traditionally, with passive scatter proton therapy, the older version, the classic indications are listed as base of skull tumors, eye tumors, brain tumors, tumors in kids, prostate cancer, and tumors in and around the spine. But now, we can treat far more complex lesions. Head and neck cancers, selected patients with breast cancer, some lung cancer patients, cancer of the esophagus, liver cancer, cancers of the pancreas, many pelvic tumors, large sarcomas, men with high risk prostate cancer, which is a very different entity than the low risk prostate cancer patients that were treated as classic indications. And of course, re-radiation after failure of prior radiation if the tumor needs further radiation to control it. I'm gonna show you some examples. 
But before I show you the examples, the obvious answer is the kids, of course. The greatest magnitude of benefit of proton therapy is our youngest pediatric patients. This is really where protons shine, they excel. So of course, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, do we have, did we have pediatric capabilities when we got going? And we really had to run fast. We had to recruit a proton pediatric radiation oncologist. We are lucky to have one of the best in the country working with us. We needed multidisciplinary relationships, not just across our hospital, but also with partner hospitals in the region, especially Nicholas Children's Hospital that has partnered with us to bring a lot of the kids for proton therapy. We had to create an anesthesia and nursing resource, hire a child life specialist, and create an environment focused on kids so that we could actually manage the adult parents. <laughs> so this is how our kids come in. They drive themselves to work. They pull up at the front, they get valeted, and then they get their own little transportation. This is a project championed by Michelle Ryder, who's sitting right behind you there, and it's one of the projects I really love. Okay. So once they come in, they get to ride the bus of hope. And if technology helps us, I will stop talking. My name is Anaya Perez. I am 12 years old and I live in Miami, Florida. Watching Anayed smile, laugh, and play with her sisters, you'd never suspect this seventh grader is battling a growing danger deep inside her brain. Anayed is a 12-year-old girl who has a benign brain tumor called a craniopharyngioma. While this tumor typically does not spread elsewhere in the body, it is in a very important location in the brain, and it can be locally aggressive, and so it can cause problems if it is not controlled. The tumor first appeared when she was just five. After surgery, Anayed recovered and went on with her life. But in the summer of 2017, her family received troubling news. We noticed on MRI that the craniopharyngioma had started to grow back slowly. In this setting, proton therapy is an excellent choice because we have the capability of stopping this tumor from growing and enabling Anayad to grow up and lead a relatively normal life without the side effects of uh, conventional radiation therapy. Unlike traditional radiation therapy, which uses x-rays, proton therapy uses streams of particles called protons to deliver the radiation dose solely to the tumor without injuring the surrounding healthy tissue. Anied's mother agreed that proton therapy was the right choice for her daughter, but there were obstacles in the way. In the hospital, I had to go to Jacksonville to receive this treatment. So I told her that it was very difficult because I didn't know anyone there. And then I thought that it would be very expensive for us. We needed a lot of money, and I have two children, they are 13. So I didn't know how to do it. Learning that Miami Cancer Institute would soon offer proton therapy changed everything. Learning that Miami Cancer Institute would soon offer proton therapy changed everything. Pediatric proton therapy patients are treated by a highly skilled team of experts dedicated to caring for the unique physical and emotional needs of children. My main role as a child life specialist is just decreasing anxiety, decreasing fear, and promoting positive coping. They feel more comfortable here because I'm a person that they see almost daily. And then the adults have someone, or the parents have someone that they can ask questions to and they can feel comfortable with. La niña está contenta porque dice que todas las personas son amables, ya casi conoce a todo el mundo, le conocen los nombres. I know there's Amanda, Amy, Luis, Rosa, Delia, Arich. Ella se siente bien feliz porque siempre encuentra acá personas eh, con tranquilidad, que le dan paz, que la saludan y todo. Entonces ella se siente como que en realidad no viene a un tratamiento, sino como que viene de visita. I have to say that she has been a pleasure to have in our department and everyone is happier when she comes to visit. She was our first pediatric patient and she was one of the easiest patients they've had, including adults. Before her treatments, Anied chooses a theme that transforms the white gantry room with its advanced proton equipment into a tranquil environment that promotes relaxation. The first word I picked was ocean, so I get to hear the whales, the dolphins, the turtles. I lay down 
and they fix my hair because my, my hair gets on the way of the mask. And then I start counting numbers so that I could, I could go to sleep. Each day we utilize um, precise imaging to precisely align uh, Anayad's anatomy and the location of the tumor so that we can deliver the radiation therapy with pinpoint precision. This enables us to provide excellent outcomes for local control while minimizing the radiation dose to surrounding critical structures. The prognosis for Anayad is excellent. We will continue to monitor her after her treatment to make sure that it never grows back and um, to monitor any um, potential side effects that can result from her prior treatment or the proton therapy. January 15th marked Ani Ed's 30th and final treatment. I feel excited because it's my last day. I don't have to come back and do my treatment. I miss you already. I'll miss them a lot. The feeling I get is hard to describe. They get to go back into this world and go back to their friends and go back to school and go back to being the normal kid that they were before all this happened. Muchas gracias por toda la atención, que estoy muy agradecida porque han atendido muy bien a Nayed. We look forward to being able to expand our services um, and um, provide this important therapy for um, all of the children who need us in South Florida. So, so I don't know if you heard the therapist describe her that she was easier than the adults. And that wasn't a superficial comment. The kids are amazing. And you know what? We lose money on every child we treat. We lose handfuls of money on every child we treat. And we will treat every child that needs to be treated because that's our commitment, that's our passion. But proton therapy is more than just for kids. It's for very challenging cancers. It's for very difficult to treat cancers. Look at this tumor. This is called a chordoma. This is a tumor of the spine. It is like a sarcoma. It's an aggressive tumor. This patient had dealt with it for years. Nobody would touch it because he would need an amputation from below his waist to have this taken care of. He would never ever walk again or have sphincter control of any nature. In a year after proton therapy, We can treat cancers of the head and neck region with protons. Nasopharynx cancer is a very challenging, complicated disease to treat. When we treat with protons, we get very precise localization that you see in red hitting the nasopharynx. When we treat with conventional radiation, we end up bathing in the entire neck and mouth. And if we do a difference, a subtraction between these two images, we get what we call a difference dose map that shows us all the excess radiation that the patient doesn't actually need. So we have subtracted out the radiation the patient needs. All of this tissue is getting excess radiation. This tissue, can, this tissue dose can be measured. The amount of excess radiation dose in this case is 25 gray. What the heck does a gray mean? In a series presented from MD Anderson Hospital, they showed that any patient that got less than 26 gray to the mouth did not require a feeding tube as a consequence of having this head and neck cancer treated. But if they got conventional photon therapy, 50% of them went on to need a feeding tube. So this is the kind of dose that makes a difference between a patient having to depend on a feeding tube or being able to feed themselves. And if you're a patient, that's a huge difference in quality of life. So people often ask me, what is a gray? What does 25 gray really mean? And it's like exchanging a currency. Unless you really know what the currency is, try exchanging a yen, right? Japan has such a strong economy. The yen must be so powerful. Yen, yen must be about a dollar? Of course not, right? We know that they're ridiculously different conversion factors. So what's the conversion factor for a gray? It's 12,500 CAT scans of the head and neck. It's five million x-rays at your dentist's office. It's 25,000 times higher than the public exposure permitted by law. It increases the relative risk of cancer by 83%. So this is what an extra 25 gray means. Now insurance companies often come to us and say, 
please go to a randomized trial and provide evidence that protons are better. Our patients have a hard time signing a consent when they know that an extra 25 gray means 5 million additional dental x-rays. I'm sure if either one of us were a patient, we would have a hard time as well. Cancer of the esophagus is another example. You can see in these two images, the normal tissue, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the breast, all get far more radiation with photons or conventional x-rays than they do with protons. And not surprisingly, when we do a comparison analysis in a series of almost 600 patients with cancer of the esophagus, on every score, whether it's toxicity to the lung, the heart, the wound toxicity, the length of hospitalization, the mortality in the first three months, protons beat out the other technologies. Breast cancer. In select women with breast cancer who need radiation to the internal memory lymph nodes just underneath the breast bone, the proximity of the heart to the chest wall, shown in red here, poses a huge challenge. Because with conventional radiation, the radiation beams are delivered in an oblique direction, shown by the yellow box, and it is simply impossible to avoid the heart and the coronary vasculature. With proton beam radiation therapy, we can deliver the beam from a single angle, sculpt and shape the radiation dose, and completely avoid the heart and the coronary vasculature. Every additional gray dose of radiation to the heart increases the risk of cardiac toxicity by 7%. These are data that were published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago on a very large cohort study from Scandinavia. So the goal in the women who need it is to lower the radiation dose to the heart as maximally as possible. There is a randomized trial that's attempting to prove this. It's going to take over 1,700 patients. The trial results will not be known for more than 15 years. This is one of the more challenging cases that we recently treated. This is an individual with anal canal cancer. And as you can see from the image on top, the pelvic structures are all spared from the excess radiation that would be delivered with photon radiation shown on the slide below. So this is a composite slide that summarizes all of the different locations in the body where this potential benefit from proton therapy. And as you can tell, I'm passionate about this and I can go on all day about each of the sites, but I'm not going to do that. However, I don't want to give you the message that every patient needs proton therapy. One of the things we do at Miami Cancer Institute because we have every major piece of technology is we do something called comparison planning. And through comparison planning, we can identify which specific patients will derive genuine benefit from proton therapy. So here's an example of a patient who came in with a tumor between his eyes. This is a tumor called a meningioma, and this patient wanted to have proton therapy. We first planned this patient's case with the image that you see on the extreme left using conventional, highly sophisticated photon radiation therapy. The dose that you see in blue is the dose to his temporal lobes, normal part of the brain, which he simply did not want. The temporal lobes are the seat of memory, and he did not want his memory impacted. So we then generated the proton plan that you can see on the far right. And as you can see, the temporal lobes are actually spared very nicely, but if you look very carefully where the yellow arrows are directed, there's extra radiation dose to the optic nerves just behind the eye. In contrast, the technology of CyberKnife achieved both objectives of sparing the optic nerves and the temporal lobe. So although this patient came specifically shopping for proton therapy, we dissuaded this patient from proton therapy and treated them with CyberKnife. So we actually select the best technology for each patient, not just one technology. It takes a team to do this, and my favorite teamwork vi video is one I cannot resist showing you. This is how the team works. We don't take one person's opinion. They're all expected to work this fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this is a daily event. Every patient gets reviewed. Every piece of information is categorically summarized and presented, and it's teamwork and team decision that selects the best therapy. So, let me conclude here. Radiotherapy using photons provides excellent outcomes for many patients. And we have every platform necessary for patients at Miami Cancer Institute. For a significant majority of our patients, 
This is an excellent treatment. Advances in proton technology for treatment of more complex tumors and treatment sites gives us an opportunity to help those patients who specifically need proton therapy. For many of these patients, this offers a chance for lowering side effects and also potentially for improving the probability of controlling the tumors. You saw the example of that chordoma that would have been impossible to treat with any other technique. We're doing a lot of clinical trials because we continue to better refine and define which subgroups of patients will benefit for pro with, with proton therapy. So we have a multitude of clinical trials for a number of our patients. It's been a pleasure. I'll take questions. Thank you.